All right, so why does it matter? <laughs> why bother to compare them, right? Their teeth, we've got a checkbox. We're a good owner, we're gonna deworm, we're gonna float our teeth, give our shots, and move down the road. So I'll uh, try to be brief. Uh, the picture, let's see if I've got a pointer. Oh, joy. Um, upper row of teeth, cheek, palate, throat's back here. This outer edge right here, you see all these marks, looks like a cat got in here and scratched this thing up pretty good. This is where the teeth have been floated all the way down to the gum level, all the way back on this outer edge, <coughs> a little bit aggressively. Um, the reason I say why bother to compare them, you can do this with either one, power floats or a hand float. Um, this one happened to be done with hand floats in Wellington, this shipped up last summer and we looked at it, but it can happen with, with either one. Um, what happens if you do that, if you overfloat a tooth or opened up a pulp? Well, li likely I'm gonna do a surgical extraction a few years later and that's what happens here. You've got five open pulp horns with headstrom files in them and a surgical screw where we've had to replace it. We sectioned the tooth and sure enough, these open pulp horns extended all the way down here and caused all of this infection. So I guess that's the reason why you might ask, does it matter how you float them and, and can problems occur from something as simple as floating teeth, which most of you in the room have had done on your horses. Um, so rather than to try to share an opinion, we try to share facts, evidence-based medicine. So there have been some reports that have looked into, you know, what happens on the surface of the tooth, and not the part that I can see, but the part I can look at with a microscope or an electron microscope. So this particular study looked at a carbide blade, which is the same thing as you'd see with a hoof rasp. This is something you put on your hand, it's gonna cut you. Um, it's fairly aggressive. This one here you can put on your hand, slide it back and forth, you're gonna get nowhere. Um, it's not gonna hurt you at all. This is a carbide disc uh, for a power float. Put that on your hand and it's also going to hurt. Um, they're, they're, those two are fairly aggressive. So what they did was they used these three products to see what would happen to the surface of the tooth. And without boring you with all of the details, these holes are normal. This is dentin, this is normal. It passes all the way to your pulp. So this is where all the blood supply of the tooth is, the center of the tooth. And the little white area right here looks like spaghetti. That belongs inside those tubules. It's no longer inside those tubules, right? So this is not good. The Velcro's come apart here. Well, what happens whenever you float teeth, this, is, this naturally occurs. And the reason it doesn't become a problem most of the time is because all the little junk and debris pack into these holes, protecting it. So what they were looking at was this smear layer that was formed. And what you'll see as an owner is you'll see this white chalky stuff that comes out whenever your horse's teeth have been floated. And what they found was that that real aggressive thing looked like a hoof rasp that was a hand float. It's the most common hand float that's used um, in the area. It doesn't produce this. It does not fill up those little Swiss cheese holes, those honeycomb holes. Um, the tungsten one that is not very aggressive and you can interpret that as you'll float all day trying to get anywhere. Um, it does form a partial one. And then the carbide disc, it creates something very similar to that. So, you know, this study was, was useful, but I say it was useful, but I would caution you to say, even though this disc created this, if that disc gets on the tongue, the cheek, the gums, anywhere else, uh, you're, you're in a world of hurt. Your horse is gonna be in a world of hurt. So there's been other studies that also looked at, you know, is motorized actually the way to go? And what can go wrong if you do power floats? So, you know, the thought was, let's evaluate a few different power floats and see if there's one that's better. Well, the summary of it was, there wasn't one that was better. It was just some take home messages of what not to do. And that was, don't float on a tooth too long. You know, more than 30 seconds is, is far too long on a horse's tooth because right here is where the pulp is. It's pretty close to the, to the surface. Extends all the way down to the roots. A lot of these teeth are four inches long for many years of their life. So what they looked at was how long does it take me to float before I get to 5.5 degrees Celsius, which we know is a critical temperature in, in human teeth. So extrapolating from human teeth, uh, that'd be an irreversible pulp damage. So the findings from this study said, if you add water whenever you're, when you're floating a tooth, particularly some of these long teeth, you've heard about wave mouths, hook mouths, some of these horses will have pretty abnormal changes in their mouth. Um, if you add water to it as you're floating them down, um, it turns out that you don't generate as much heat. And so, um, you know, I guess my take home or summary would be that both hand floats and power floats can be used safely. Um, it's just a matter of what type are you using and are you knowledgeable about the different types of blades and discs that are out there. Um, our preference certainly is to use water irrigation to try to keep the teeth cool. Um, and this is mostly imperative whenever you're reducing a, a tooth that's overgrown quite too long. 
Um, there are some things that can be done if you get a tooth that's been damaged, decayed, uh, damaged from the floating, and I just leave you with a picture of a cavity filling that we've done, and um, these are things that can be done in horses' teeth, even though uh, they're fairly uncommon. Thanks.